I, I think that this is as good a time as any to uh, to take it away. So um, we are. Uh, it's our our uh, honor and pleasure today to have uh, Professor Imogen Co from Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada, uh, to speak to us and. and Probably her one of her earlier and our our final activity of the day uh, work related, such as the miracle of time zones. Um, Imogen was ed educated first in Exeter in the UK and then in Victoria, British Columbia, in Canada in biology. Um, after uh, a few temporary uh, positions, she started a faculty career at York University. And in 2012, she moved to Ryerson. Uh, she specializes in cell biology and specifically in drug transport through cell membranes. So her, uh, her research group is actually based in a hospital, in St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. Um, she has quite broad um, uh, leadership and managerial and consulting experience next to her academic experience. For example, she's the founding dean of the Faculty of Science at, at Ryerson, and we can all understand from not wanting to be deans how big a job that is. And uh, she's also been on several boards, juries and panels in her field, both due to her biology expertise, but also due to her um, expertise in EDI and scientific culture building. So she's a well-known expert on that uh, and, and a thought leader. And, and therefore, uh, we hope to learn a lot from her. So I would say, without further ado, Imogen, please take it away. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to, um, to, to be here in this virtual world. Um, I hope one day we'll actually be in the real world and we can continue these conversations. Um, so uh, let's hope the technology is on our side and you can now see my screen. I'm hoping that the subtitles will work. I am out in uh, the country. So sometimes my internet connection is a little bit unstable and, then, and we lose the subtitles. The subtitles so then, are working. Okay, excellent. Um, so there is the information. Thank you, Ralph, for that very generous um, introduction. Um, I'm coming to you from Toronto, but we now typically in North America and um, other parts of the world that have experienced a, a very colonial, disruptive, um, uh, violent kind of background, we now um, really try to be intentional about acknowledging the creative peoples, the scholars, the innovators, the, the educators, the, the scientists who have been living on this land and trying to understand the world around them, just as we are trying to do. Um, and they've been doing this for many thousands of years. And the people that have lived on the land, um, as you can see, this map shows you all the uh, incredible diversity of communities and nations um, and peoples who have lived um, across Canada. Um, these peoples um, learned uh, and created uh, different kinds of governance systems. They knew how to manage the resources and be sustainable. The region I'm in is known as the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Treaty, which was a treaty between Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee to look after the land and share it to ensure that the um, resources were sustainable and, and were there for everybody. And it's a dish with one spoon in that there is one spoon that we all share. Um, so there was a lot of knowledge, creativity, insights, uh, and, and there was a sort of you know, applied research in many ways. Um, and yet we do not acknowledge, particularly in those countries with colonial histories, we don't often acknowledge the contributions or the or the information that was gained over thousands of years um, because of racist colonial attitudes. And so we're trying to really think about that more deeply and bring that into some of our thinking about inclusive excellence. 
So I'm in downtown Toronto, as I mentioned, it's the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement Territory. I'm actually on, on Williams Treaty land right now, which is where I'm working from home. And the name of my university is actually um, changing. So by April of this year, we will likely possibly have a new name for the university. And this is, a, again, a reflection of um, going to those uncomfortable places and thinking about how we create the institutions that do research and how we think about um, you know, where we're doing what we're doing. And so there was a, a statue for the namesake of my institution, um, I was standing here for a while and uh, last year uh, students and others came together and pulled down the statue. It's just a statue. It's just a statue. Um, and uh, it's just a reflection that um, we need to be going to some of these uncomfortable places and thinking about how we do what we do as human beings, as human endeavors. So I will probably refer to my institution as X University because we're undergoing a, a transformation to a, to a new name. Um, I am a scientist, but I talk about uh, equity, diversity and inclusion. And I think it's really important to um, sort of explain why that is, because just because I'm a woman in science doesn't make me an expert on women in science. And I don't have a background in gender studies or also sort of human rights law or you know, organizational management. So I think it's important to, to explain how I got to the point of doing what I'm doing. So here is B. World's most beautiful baby, obviously. Um, my lovely dad, who is uh, who was a chemist, um, and uh, I had a great passion for science. I loved science. I grew up in Cambridge, in Cambridge in the um, in, in the UK, little village just outside outside of Cambridge. So I was well aware of sort of academic elitism. I was well aware of great science being done at great institutions, um, but I was also aware that Cambridge has a long, long history of exclusionary behaviour. Um, here's a, a picture from about, a, you know, just over 100 years ago of when um, the votes were happening to allow women access to Cambridge and they were quite violent. This, this effigy was mutilated during this particular protest. Um, and so exclusionary behavior in academia was something that was really kind of on my front doorstep. And I was aware of it because my parents grew up in very, um, uh, very uh, deprived Kind of backgrounds, um, very low socioeconomic backgrounds, and they were not able to go to university except for changes in the law after the Second World War that opened up the university. So Cambridge, you know, it's uh, founded in the Middle Ages. All of our universities are built on Eurocentric medieval models that were founded by rich old white men for rich young white men, not even all men, rich white men. Um, and they, they're built on exclusionary principles. Um, and so why we kind of are completely wedded to this, this model that we have for how research and science is done in these structures has always been a bit of a puzzle. And I've always been aware of the exclusionary behaviors um, and exclusionary practices from a very early age. I think I was raised with, with sort of strong social justice values. Um, I had a passion for science and um, I also had a passion for adventure. Um, I wanted to be Freya Stark or, or Gertrude Bell. I wanted to trek across North Africa and, and do those kinds of things and, and, and maybe be an anthropologist, I don't know. But uh, my father, when I was about 12, my father took me to an open house at Cambridge University. Um, and one of the places you could go visit was the, um, the, the home state, the home institute of the British Antarctic Survey. So the, the home base at Cambridge um, of the British Antarctic Survey, and the British Antarctic Survey has a research center at the South Pole. And I had an aspiration to work there, and I thought this was the most exotic, most exciting kind of research you could do. I could be an, like an environmental chemist or something. Um, I thought this was exciting, and, and I really had a sort of a, a dream that that would be something that I could aim for. I like science, I like math, um, I like travel. I thought it was exciting. I, I wasn't worried by something, you know, the, the sort of um, the, the challenges associated with remote locations. And so I bounced up to somebody sitting at a desk handing out pamphlets at this open house. And I said, um, I'm really interested in working at the British Antarctic Survey when I get my degree and all that kind of thing. How many women do you have working there? So this would have been, um, in the mid 1970s, let's say. Um, and he, in a very sort of dismissive way, said, well, it's a very stressful environment and we don't want to add to the stress by putting women there. So there are no women working at the South Pole. 
And so at that moment, I had a very clear and explicit in my face kind of message that said, you can't do that on the basis of a characteristic that had nothing to do with my ability. So it wasn't like you're good at it or you're bad at it. I mean, that's why we want you or don't want you. It, had, it was on the basis of something that was completely separate, irrational, irrelevant nonsense. And so from that time, and given the sort of the, the way I was raised, I've always been really aware that there are people who are not able to do things, including science and medicine, on the basis of characteristics that have nothing to do with their ability. Now, I have been very fortunate and very privileged to be able to pursue a career in biomedical sciences. Here is, this is a few years ago now, here I am in the lab with, with some of my trainees um, doing our research. So I have been able to build a career um, very successfully and I'm very grateful for that. But I've always been aware and always been interested in the structures that block other people, talented people, clever people out on the basis of nothing to do with their um, ability. So I've done all the things that you're expected to do as a scientist. I publish, I get grants, um, train students, teach students, that kind of thing. But I've also been involved and published and researched and immersed myself deeply in the scholarship around how does science work or how do we do science or what do we need to do to make science as a culture, as a human endeavor better? How can we do that? And so that's I've had these two parallel strands, sort of you know, like DNA strands um, throughout my career, which is doing the science, but also asking questions about how do we do the science? And so that's how I got to where I am. And as a consequence of being an academic scientist, I've been able to bring that sort of legitimacy and credibility, uh, but also the insights to, and the ones that are circled here are to the federal funding agencies in Canada, for example, um, and to various organizations that do science or do research, um, but are looking for ways to really embed principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So being a scientist, but also being sort of immersed <coughs> and having um, this parallel strand of always being uh, interested in how we do science um, is got sort of where, how I've got to where I am. So there are two big questions really that we're asking here, which is who does the research? Who is the person going to the South Pole? Who asks the questions or frames the debate or interprets the data? Who decides on the priorities? Um, it's not just a question of how many girls in the lab do you have? It's like, who's driving the agenda? Who's directing uh, the community? And is that culture and are those people um, being intentionally uh, EDI and A infused. So that's equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility infused. Um, so that's talking about inclusive excellence in researchers. And then the second question, which is perhaps more relevant to the life sciences, the biomedical sciences, is how is the research conducted? Does it use a sex and gender-based analysis approach? That's not just sex and gender, that's an intersectional approach. Are you just using male rats in the lab? Are you using databases of proteomics, genomics that reflect the entire population? Are you um, doing all your analysis on just white people? Are you including black people in your, in your, you know, your, your cancer surveys, that kind of thing? Um, and if you're not doing that, you're not being experimentally rigorous. So are you using a fully EDINA infused approach to ensure experimental rigor? Um, and are we recognizing and rewarding that rigor, that best science? And so that's inclusive excellence in research. And these two things are, are really linked. You can't have one with the, without the other. So it's a question of who's doing the science and how is the science being done and applying an EDINA lens to both to get inclusive excellence. And I think as all of you are aware, um, the discussions around these issues and the discussion around the need for inclusive excellence have not always been um, well received. And as somebody who's been in the field for many decades now, I can tell you um, that yes, I've certainly been marginalized. It's not a pop popular position, but I look to this phrase from Adlai Stevenson, all progress has resulted from people who took unpopular positions. And we're seeing now an increased and enhanced understanding of why we need inclusive excellence and how it adds rigor to, to um, what we do. Um, that takes us, you know, that requires us to go into some un uncomfortable truths. And as one of the great privileges of being a dean of science and a chair, before that, a chair of a very broad department of biology, now dean of science, 
um, is that I got to see how different disciplines um, conducted themselves. And there is no doubt that different scientific disciplines have different cultures. And uh, it always sort of surprises me that the chemists think that every, all scientists are like chemists and the biologists think that all biologists are like, yeah, all, all scientists are like biologists. It's not true. And this is a, you know, <laughs> this is a cartoon which is kind of reflective of the fact that academic research is done by different people in different contexts. And there are cultures in different scientific disciplines. And I had somebody recently tell me that physics is pure, so we don't have to worry about this EDI stuff. Um, sociology is messy and you know, you, you're a biologist because you can't make it as a chemist, you know, this kind of thing. So, um, so we really can um, see this, this is real. It's not good or bad. We don't have to have a value judgment to it. We just have to say people are human, scientists are human, and we need to be aware of, of, of our humanity. Um, we need to be aware of our humanity because humans are very flawed organisms. We're inherently biased and there's good evolutionary biology and neuroscience behind that. I have a background in neuroscience when I explain why we are hardwired to be biased. Um, and we exist within societies that have structurally embedded those biases. They could be you know, racism, colonialism. Researchers work in these contexts and we can't be the best kinds of researchers if we don't consider these things, if we don't you know, basically calibrate ourselves. We don't have that self-awareness and ensure that understanding ourselves fully and honestly allows us to add that level of rigor into what we're doing. Um, this is the fields arranged by purity, but I just wanna give a shout out to my, all my colleagues in the social sciences and humanities, because what is the nature of knowledge and who gets to decide what knowledge is? Um, has us turning to the philosopher's epistemology. Um, and we need to be thinking about that too. So I'm a big fan of sort of a much more interdisciplinary approach to thinking about what is the nature of knowledge and who gets to decide. And so we have to um, have those conversations about things like the myth of objectivity. We think that we are objective. I hear this all the time. I don't need to write an EDI statement for my grant because I'm objective. I take the best uh, the myth of meritocracy. This is from a couple of years ago in, in Canada. Here are all the provincial and territorial leaders. And you can't tell me that this is a merit meritocratic process, um, that this is the best we can do. Here, there's all nine or 11 of them or whatever it is. And it's like, oh, we've got some diversity in, in color of trousers there, I think. So, and the myth of the academic researcher, which is this kind of lone, solo, kind of um, sort of almost antisocial kind of like you have to lock yourself away for hours and hours and hours, and that's that's the that's how academic research advances. Well, no, these are all myths, and we need to challenge them. Um, and the myth, these myths protect power and privilege, particularly the myth of meritocracy. It protects those with power and privilege, and when you're accustomed to privilege, equity feels like oppression. So I've also heard this. I had a um, someone in a, a young man in physics that I, I was at a I was giving a talk a conference and afterwards um, chatting about it and his frustration in that he and he said I'm never going to get a job because they only hire women now in physics um, and I said do you have any evidence to back that up so you know the idea that building some equity and transparency and rigor into the system um, is actually uh, you know a good thing to that individual who's accustomed to privilege felt like oppression um, and so really working on self-awareness and really sort of upskilling and educating. Um, you may have seen this cartoon. Uh, you know, we need, first of all, differentiate between equality. Giving people the same thing doesn't always um, mean equity is fairness. And we want to be moving over here to cultures of, of care and, and inclusive excellence where we really are talking about justice. So the cause of the inequity, the barrier has been identified and removed. And I think, particularly in Canada, I think we have a little bit of a, a challenge to, to remind scientists that society, that uh, science takes place in society. Um, there's still a bit of a sense of um, you can't be a scientist and be an activist. You can't be a scientist and be an advocate. Um, and we really have to move past that because scientists are subject to and products of their environment. And, you know, this, we had a, a big um, national 
sort of reckoning last summer in Canada, which was the discovery or the rediscovery or the um, media news around the um, unmarked graves that were present um, across the country at many former residential schools and unmarked graves, particularly of children who had died um, at these residential schools um, and who would not return to their um, to their parents, to their families, to their nations. Um, and uh, we have an indigenous front forensic pathologist who is now working to, um, to identify um, as much as possible uh, remains so that they can be returned to their ancestral lands and to their, to their communities. Um, and so science and society, are, you know, we're all intertwined and we have to think and act intentionally and intersectionally to embed the principles of EDINA into our activities and create those cultures of care. Um, I think also just uh, Canada, we tend to think of as being, um, you know, smaller liberal progressive, but no, structurally there is racism in these institutions, there is homophobia in these institutions. Our universities in Canada are built on that medieval Eurocentric model um, and it's not a great model. And so here's an example, Queen's University, which is just up the road from me in Ontario. Um, there, was there was a policy that was introduced that said black medical students were not welcome. They actually were quite progressive as an institution. They had black students in their medical school um, at the beginning of the last century, but after the First World War, there was a sort of a backlash and they introduced a policy that said, if you're a black student in the medical school, you have to leave and we will not accept any black students. So they actually introduced specific policies and this was sort of rediscovered by um, a physicist. Ed Thomas, um, who discovered that this policy was still on the books, officially on the books, even though over time they had obviously become more, more aware and it has sort of dropped from the, from the um, admissions, um, actually act, admissions act, um, activities, but uh, he brought it forward and um, had it helped get it officially removed from the books. And um, also now all medical students are educated mandatory courses for all medical students on institutionalized structural racism. So, you know, we need to be looking for it, digging for it. It's uncomfortable, but we need to be looking for it. It's uncomfortable, it's hard work, and we need to be, um, we need to be ready, and we need to have um, plans in place for being, um, for responding to the pushback. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge again in Canada, we're being polite, um, is a sort of a Canadian characteristic, um, but being polite can mean being conflict avoidant, it can also be uh, passive aggressive. And those with the power and privilege, as you know, have the most responsibility to, to affect change. Diversity makes for better outcomes. Sarah Kaplan, Institute for Gender and the Economy at the University of Toronto is an international leader in this area and has done a lot of work on um, why uh, the tensions that you might get in diverse teams can lead to uh, increased levels of creativity. So we really need to be um, working on that self-awareness. We need to be focusing on um, understanding ourselves and our systems and recalibrating against those inherent biases. And we we can study ourselves. It's not, this is not nothing new, this is not surprising, this is why we need to talk to the, um, the human psychologists and the behavioral economists and um, understand how people work um, and call people in, call, call men in, call people in um, and create safe places for us to have some of these difficult conversations. When I've been talking to scientists in particular who hang on to that myth of objectivity, I try to use sometimes scientific analogies to help sort of think about that self-awareness. And so this is a paper we put out last year in the Canadian Journal of Chemistry, a, a young colleague, a chemist and myself. Um, and it's really about, you know, the narrow ways we think about ability um, and human humanity. So here's the spectrum, here's the spectrum of humanity. And here's some kind of thing that we're calling ability. And here's some measure that we have of, in quotes, excellence. Um, and we have narrow windows of what we think of as um, who we're looking for. And so we, you know, we're looking for people on these measures of excellence and they're going to exceed this kind of level. So we're going to pick up these people, but we don't think outside that box, as it were. And so there are other people that we might not be looking for. We might not, we might not consider because of the structures we have in place for, for instance, hiring or our measures of excellence. And as a consequence, you know, we're looking for, what is it, seven people. We actually drop below 
because we're still kind of thinking of that very narrow window of what we're looking for and we're actually not getting the best. So if we're not intentionally scanning the spectrum of humanity, that is applying principles of EDI and A in our cultures, we're certainly embedding mediocrity. And there's some evidence and some data from other disciplines that this is actually what's happening. It's a bit of a hard thing to study, but it's something to think about. Another way that I've presented it to scientists is to think about recalibration. So we know that when, for instance, we're selecting the most excellent person, then we're thinking about CVs, we're thinking about citations, letters of reference, student evaluations, all of the things that feed into our hiring practices um, and our subject you know, potentially to implicit bias, not because people are evil, but because people are biased. We are hardwired to be biased. <laughs> it has protected us over evolutionary time. Um, and so think about ourselves, think about um, these biases and think about our brain as being one of the instruments in the lab that we must ensure that is calibrated. So if we were looking for, let's say, the excellent protein out of a mixture of proteins, in the lab, we might be using HPLCs and, and chromatography and mass specs and other machines. And we would uh, always make sure that they are calibrated. We would always make sure that they are as calibrated, as accurate, as precise as possible. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to say that we're sure we're actually getting what we claim we're getting. And similarly, if we knew that one of those machines was off by 5%, or if we knew that each one of those machines was off by 5%, then we would you know, we wouldn't carry on and say, oh, we've got the best thing, even though we know they're all 5% miscalibrated. Um, but when we know our brains, our processes are miscalibrated, we know that, we can study that, we can measure that, there's tons of tons of research and scholarship to support that, um, then it's incumbent on us to actually fix that and calibrate, calibrate, calibrate. And then we can be sure, or we can be, we can be more confident that we're actually getting what we claim to be getting. And so we have all of these kind of biases we know about, like the Matthew effect or the confirmation bias. This is from San Francisco's uh, Declaration on Research Assessment. Tons of great resources there. We can look at all of these things and we can actually calibrate against these biases. We can calibrate against the Matthew effect. We can downplay the importance of awards. We can sort of dilute out that bias. Um, and we can look at other kinds of biases that we can, we can be really intentional about to calibrate. And we know that different disciplines are doing this. So one, again, one of the one of the things I do is try to monitor what's going on in different disciplines. Chemistry has a bit of a culture of being mean. It's a mean culture, which is why people don't want to stay there. That, that you know, it doesn't it doesn't hang on particularly to women. Um, and this is the UK. So this is chemistry in the UK that recognizes that recognize that they were losing talent, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and really have been uh, looking to. Um, address those cultural and structural and systemic issues so that they can leverage talent, so that they can improve the rigor in the discipline. I would say chemistry in Canada um, is behind. It's not as advanced in its in its discussion, um, but you know other other disciplines are further ahead. So we know that different disciplines are actually addressing the issues in different places. This is also in the UK, um, and this is the Department of Chemistry at York. At the University of York, not the one I was, this is the one in the UK, um, who is one of the leading departments in, Cat in uh, the UK around embedding equity and diversity into the departmental culture. And so if you go to their website, you can see all of the things that they do in this department of chemistry. It's just an academic department in, a, in, a, in an old university, but all of the things that they do to pay attention to creating that culture of care, creating that culture where people look at this and they say, wow, I think I really wanna go work there. And indeed they measure their applications. They measure who's applying to them. And it is, it's an, it's a, you know, it's a, rec a recruitment, um, tool like people want to go work there because they know that it's um, going to be a good place to work if you have a family if you want to you know if you want to work life balance if you if you want transparent open kind of discussions around various things and the welcome foundation in the UK also has some very good sort of um, frameworks and, and good materials around how they're embedding um, uh, EDI and A to create these cultures of care and importantly in chemistry at York, um, this, you know, this, I put this in because the response 
that you'll often hear is, okay, this EDI stuff, it kind of dumbs everything down, it lowers the bar, we're, we're letting people in who aren't qualified, all those kind of things. But if you look at the outputs, which is what chemistry at York have done and what other institutes I know have done, you can see that actually their outputs um, haven't changed or they've improved by the traditional metrics. So chemistry at York, 94% of their research is considered world leading or internationally ex excellent, that's the REF. Um, exercise, which, you know, we have problems with the ref, but um, it's certainly, you know, they have the, the, this culture that they are, be, that they have established in their, in their division there is not degrading by those standards and certainly they're bringing in lots of money. So these are the metrics that the institutions often use to look to see who's doing well or, you know, funding agencies. Um, they're attracting great people, they're creating a culture where people can do their best work um, and the outputs you know, speak to that. Welcome Foundation or the Welcome Trust um, has actually done a recent survey about culture, which is worth a read, um, and some suggestions that they have. So the Welcome is Welcome Trust is very much sort of more biomedical, life sciences, but it, it has some good information in there. Um, specific things, changing funding structures, the criteria to improve incentives, um, other things that you can look at in the, in the research. And importantly, participants said that the research culture is best when it's creative, supportive, and collaborative. Now, how would you go about doing that? It's going to depend on what kind of institution you're in, how big your division is. You know, you can do it at your group level, you can do it at your research team level, or you can do it at your departmental level, your institute level, that kind of thing. It's scalable, but changing culture in your local context is going to be bespoke. It's going to be, you know, you're going to have to design that for your local con your local context based on these guiding principles. So, um, so some good sort of uh, sort of directives from other disciplines to give us ideas about what we can do wherever we are. Um, and I put this in just because I had a conversation recently with some um, astronomy colleagues around the um, JWST um, uh, results that were um, announced, which was that when they did the double blind process that there, you know, there was a shift in the demographics of who got time on the telescope. And so if this is an evidence of when we recalibrate our processes, our previous biases become obvious. Obviously, there was a problem previously, there was some kind of bias there, because when we double blinded it, and we improved the rigor of the process, we got a different outcome. So that said, there was something miscalibrated about the previous process, despite all of those scientists who say, oh, I'm objective, I just go on merit. Well, you know, we can do that, we can run the experiment, we can do the analysis. So removing bias adds rigor. Um, and the conversation I had recently with some colleagues was like, how could we adapt this double blind review process to my discipline, to the biomedical sciences? And I still haven't quite figured out how that's possible, but it's something to think about. Um, and research must be inclusive. So this is something that I think has, has sort of been later to our discussions around who's, uh, who's doing the science, where are the ideas coming from? Um, and we published a paper last year, beginning of last year, about creating inclusive and accessible conferences. And this is my friend Mahadeo, <clears throat> when he was much, much younger. This, <laughs> it doesn't look like he's quite a bit older than this now. Um, who has a PhD in molecular genetics and is legally blind and is the research director for the Canadian National Institutes for the Blind and um, has literally written a book called Creating Culture of Accessibility in Sciences. How do we create science that actually allows everybody to, to contribute? Um, Stephen Hawking was at Cambridge. You used to see him trundling across campus at high speed in very alarming ways, um, but he would not have been able to go to Cambridge if he had arrived using a mobility device. He arrived at Cambridge as a fully able-bodied individual, um, but you know the, his brain power didn't change as a consequence of his physical disability, but the chances of him being um, provided access um, would have been vastly reduced. And even now when I go and give talks and I look at podiums and I look at the steps up to the podium, I point out, and I'm giving a talk on EDI, I point out to the organizers this is not accessible. And it's not just the Stephen Hawking's of the world, it's somebody who broke their leg skiing yesterday, or it's somebody who um, you know, has a bit of, a, has a, bit of a, um, a balance issue. So it's really about creating environments where everybody 
can have access and can contrib contribute. And when we do that, when we create environments where, where different ways of thinking and different kind of, you know, ways of being creative about things can, can be allowed to flourish, then we can get different ways of sort of analysis. And so Wanda Diazma said, who is blind, um, introduced, you know, a new way of thinking about analysis of astron astron astronomical data um, using soundscapes. And I don't know if that's better or worse, but I think that's interesting. It's just a different way of thinking about things that maybe would, you know, reveal things that we had missed previously. And I added this um, in because I often use this to, to point out the value of inclusive design in teaching. So there are concepts that can be very challenging for students. And in this article from the New York Times, this is 10 years ago now, um, the example they use is mass and weight. Um, and the article is about creating language for um, hearing impaired. So creating sign language for science. So creating sign language for things like a gene or genetics or um, all of the words, all of the jargon we have in science, um, we need to create the, the signs for those things. And you know the, the discovery that some of the signs using sign language actually helped hearing students understand concepts and mass and weight with the, with the concepts that they bring up here that, that can be challenging for first year students. So mass and weight are similar. When they're written, it's hard to differentiate between them, but when you use sign language, then hearing students can actually sort of access the concepts much more intuitively. So the idea that, um, you know, universal design, creating cultures of accessibility actually helps everybody and demographics that maybe you didn't expect to or you weren't planning to you pick up you pick up people and groups that you didn't realize could be helped and there's nothing like this online world that we're in now um, to remind us that science has not been accessible and that uh, conferences teaching mentoring you know we're all trying to figure out how to do these things in an online way um, and we could have been doing them in much more accessible ways all along but for whatever reason, we weren't, and we didn't, and we couldn't, and we, you know, and we need to be thinking about those things. It's also clear that the demographics have been hit differentially as a, a consequence of the pandemic. So while it might have opened up some aspects of accessibility, it certainly impacted other aspects um, of progress. And this is a statement from a, a colleague of mine in math who overheard so she's a mother of three of two preschool children who overheard her colleague in math, who is a mid-career science professor with a, a wife who does all the childcare. Um, she overheard him saying when the university was shifting to online in March 2022, I'm going to get so many papers written now. Because, you know, going to an online, not having to commute, having somebody take care of all the, all the childcare allowed him a, a level of freedom that he did not have before. And sure enough, he's written a lot of papers and she has really struggled. Um, so when we're creating cultures of care and inclusive excellence, we need to be identifying those barriers that you know make things inaccessible or make things challenging. And we also need to be acting towards inclusive climates to allow people to bring their full selves and, and really be supported. So you know we want to be sure that we're supporting um, you know, inclusive excellence in researchers, but we also want to be sure that we're supporting inclusive excellence in research. So that really means, you know, how do we think about evaluating, for instance, what somebody has been doing during the pandemic if they are an academic mother or if they have childcare issues or if they have elder care issues? Um, we need to be thinking about how do we evaluate? How do we value the contributions? How are we going to think about the metrics that we've been using for so long? Because we know that we've had a very narrow view of scientific impact. Um, we know for hiring, we know that we have biases, we know hiring, grants, all of these kinds of things. Um, we have this narrow view. And so, you know, the pandemic maybe has sort of um, encouraged that conversation that was already ongoing about an inclusive view of scientific impact. You can't publish as many papers if you have two in a preschool or two school age children are trying to homeschool and you know you're a single parent i have a colleague who's a single mother of three children because her husband died last year um, and she is an academic um, how do you put together a tenure file so we need to be thinking much more broadly about the contributions that 
uh, people make to the scientific community. So this is a quote from some work that we're doing with a, with a physics institute um, as, a, as a consultancy um, about, you know, what is the culture? What is, how are we um, measuring people and their productivity? And, um, and this individual said, in academia, we have intellectual ableism. We foster those who are the fastest, regardless of their personal circumstances. Intellectual elitism is within the system and the metrics that we use today are proxies for privilege. We've not yet derived metrics to look at potential. So this is really, um, this is tricky. Um, this is requires a higher level of intellectual engagement. And so when people are dismissive um, about these kinds of conversations, I simply tell people you're being intellectually lazy. And I have no time for people who are intellectually lazy or cynical because these are complex and important questions about how do we do science and how do we do better science and how do we do more rigorous science? This particular paper came out in PLOS Biology last year um, and talks about things that can be done, actions, depending on sphere of influence. So mentors, administrators, scientific societies, funding agencies, um, all sorts of actions that can be considered, um, which can be sort of, um, you know, relatively um, low effort to quite complex but actions that can be considered to create more inclusive scientific environments and cultures of care. So things that people can do depending on where they are. And this really builds on the work that you know about from the Leiden Manifesto for research metrics and DORA, um, tons of great resources. But I think the pandemic has really given us sort of a, a, real, a, a real sort of push to, to really looking at how do we evaluate contributions. What does it mean for somebody like myself, who has had a lot of input into science policy, who has really worked a lot over many years with the science funding organizations to really get them to think about embedding equity, diversity, inclusion. I don't know where that goes on my CV. In fact, the format for the federal CV for federal um, grant applications doesn't have a section, it does now, because a number of us have been advocating for it. Science policy, science communication. What If you have created an environment where other people can flourish, that's a pretty important thing. If you are the diva who you know is, is ruthlessly working their way towards a Nobel Prize and cutting people down on, the, on your way, but, but yes, you're brilliant, but you've created a toxic environment for everybody else, you know, how do we consider that? Maybe you've got lots and lots of papers, but you created a toxic environment along the way and lots of other people failed as a consequence. So we need to be really having some of these difficult conversations. One of the places that's doing really interesting work is the, um, the Research Culture Lab at the University of Glasgow. So I would encourage you to go take a look at what they're doing there. And they're really looking to um, look to see how, how can we assess people's um, research track records. And for an, an example of um, something that, you know, I've been advocating for a long time is as a senior researcher, I don't want to know how many awards you've received. I don't actually care how many awards you've received as a senior researcher, but I would be interested in the number of nominations you've made. So yes, you're a senior researcher, you've done well, you've established, you know, you don't need any more awards, but I would value and I would recognize and I would give credit if you were someone who was nominating next generation scientists. And so University of Glasgow has actually built that now into their promotion um, and tenure kinds of documents. And they're looking at, you know, things like, you know, what are your contributions to collegiality, to career development, research recognition? Are you somebody who's advocated very loudly? Have you sat on a government panel, you know, for open research, that kind of thing? Um, and so there's lots of sort of interesting resources there about broadening those metrics. So finally, <laughs> um, taking that all together, you know, using um, evidence-based data-driven interventions that address organizational, institutional, structural, and systemic barriers. And one of the things I see organizations do, perhaps less so in, in the academic research world, but certainly in the corporate world, um, is not use evidence-based data-driven interventions. So what does the evidence tell us about what actually works? We don't need more science camps for little girls. The evidence in support of that is pretty weak that actually shifts culture that actually adds to retention and recruitment. Shifting culture 
changing culture, creating environments that are appealing and warm and welcoming, actually educating men on things like, um, you know, toxic masculinity and, and ensuring that there are leadership core competencies around EDI principles and the application of EDI principles. It's how you create cultures that will draw people in and will make people want to be there. What are you doing that's anti-racist in your organization? And what are you doing to ensure that that, that you know, that one um, member of the, the LGBTQ community that you are recruiting is going to feel welcomed and safe on an ongoing basis, not just recruitment, but beyond that. That's another place I see organizations um, sort of fail. It's like, yes, we're hiring in a diverse way, but we're not doing anything to make sure those people are supported. And move from asking why demographics are underrepresented. Why aren't there enough? Why aren't there very many X in X? You know, why aren't there many whatever in chemistry or biology? Ask why some demographics are overrepresented. And it kind of shifts the way we think about the conversation. It shifts our thinking, and it really brings in those sort of aspects of privilege and and structural bias. We really need to incentivize reward and have consequences for people that don't do things. I would say the funding agencies in Canada have got quite good at this now. If you don't know how to embed EDI into your research program, you won't get money or you won't get as much money. So it's really um, driving a shift in culture or at least an awareness. Um, we do need data. We In Canada, we're very data poor. Um, and we can look to what people and organizations and cultures are doing in other places because there are big differences in culture, even in discipline, even in the same discipline in different parts of the world. And I think really, demanding better, being unpopular, going to those uncomfortable places, demanding inclusive leadership from everybody, just putting, you know, putting somebody in uh, in charge of an organization just because of the demographic isn't, um, isn't, they need to have the core competences, they need to be skilled, they need to have the skill set. And that's what I talk about quite a lot in my Lancet paper from a couple of years ago. And it really takes courage. And, you know, we do this, because of these little packets of potential. So this is the March from Science in Toronto. So I, yeah, I call these, these little, I don't know if this is a girl or a boy, it doesn't matter, um, little packets of potential. And I know from the work I do of many years that we are losing talent and that we are losing creativity and that we are losing um, real skill sets and insights and innovation because we just haven't calibrated our systems very well and because we're not self-aware. So we can do better. Oh, and finally, yes, the British Antarctic Survey. Um, it has, it, you know, I didn't change. I didn't lean in. I didn't, you know, take more training to, to, to build my confidence. I didn't do anything. The British Antarctic Survey changed its culture. It, it, it's now winning awards as an inclusive and diverse environment. Um, it really made it intentional. It made it part of its core values as an organization. And it really had made a commitment. It shifted its culture. Um, it shifted the way it did business. And so it's really about uh, looking for those structures, about having leadership that's intentional about shifting culture. And it can be done. And, uh, you know, I wish that they had been this way when I was 12 years old, but I'm happy that they're there now because there'll be a 12 year old out there who says that's where I wanna go and um, they'll make it happen. Thanks very much. I'm happy to ask, um, answer any questions or I hope that was coherent. I'm gonna stop sharing if that's okay. So I can see people, there we go. Thank you very much, Imogen. That was very stimulating. Um, could I um, ask for questions? Yes, Ilse? Yes, thanks. Um, that was a very dense lot of information. Thanks, uh, okay. it was really very interesting. What, what triggered me was the statement about intellectual ableism and, and looking for potential instead. Uh, but I didn't quite pick up if, if there are people already looking into metrics that could be used for that instead of what we use now. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? So, yeah, that's a great question. And it, it is a very dense presentation. I'll send it to you. There's lots of resources in there um, that you know may or may not be useful. So I'm happy to share. Um, so that's a... You know, I, I think we've, be, it's a great question. I think we've got much better at recognizing um, 
metrics that are proxies for privilege. So we've got better at doing that. So an example that we often use um, is sort of volunteering in the lab. So yes, our, our students can volunteer in the lab over the summer and that gives them experience. They put it on a CV. People like to see that on the CV, but volunteering in the lab over the summer is a proxy for privilege because most students need to work to earn money to go to, go to university. So, um, so don't count it so, um, so strongly. Um, there is some work that, that Glasgow is doing um, and there is some discussion around how do you measure potential and, I think some of the more advanced kind of conversations coming out of, of sort of the more business side of things. And, and what I've seen, I, I don't think we have a good handle on it, particularly for science, but what I've seen is um, a sort of uh, taking much more time to have interviews or to drill into somebody's um, thinking around things like creativity and how would you come up with questions and how would you deal with, with a challenge. And so a little bit more of the sort of situational kind of questioning that sometimes you see in some interview settings um, that particularly I'm thinking potential for young people sort of going forward, um, looking at those kinds of responses. So, you know, we often test students, particularly in the life sciences on memorization. Um, and that's what we test on and they can get very good grades on memorizing and regurgitation. What we wanna be testing them on is understanding concepts and the ability to apply those concepts. So I don't have a great answer. I think it's a really tough one, but I do know people are. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really, it. really happy that you mentioned creativity because I've been thinking about this in the last weeks a lot after discussing with a, uh, a person who is an illustrator uh, and mm -hmm. discussing the, 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 the likeness of the, pro the, uh, the process of doing science yeah. is yeah. very, very similar to creating art. In the that it seems to the audience that we're going in a straight line from A to B and we find a conclusion which fits perfectly with A, but it, it's never that. It's always yeah. much more complicated. And that, that, that creative thinking is something that, that I feel is terribly missing in all the metrics that we use at the moment. So thanks. I agree. It's, it's certainly one that I can imagine that this is a very difficult conversation because it, it, it's, it strikes right at the core of our values where... We feel that, you know, uh, some level of intellectual ability, probably a very high one, is, is what we fancy we all have. And that's why we are here. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, that's survivor bias. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's also it, it seems it, it, it may be a bit more than that. It may, may hit at the essence of what we think science is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, and you know, when you think about different cultures in science, I think, uh, you know, my science, the life sciences, I think is in some ways, uh, you know, because of sort of the golden age of biology, right, has sort of happened and the massive explosion of information and the sheer volume of information with the Human Genome Project and, you know, just so much information that we assume accumulation of information is a measure of intellectual ability. And um, I think, you know, I think the creativity part is, is lost, has, is really buried in the life sciences and we need to throw out all the content. We need to go back to thinking about, um, you know, interesting questions. Um, I think I kind of feel, I'm not a physicist, but I kind of feel like physics is a little bit more, um, ahead in that in that sense um thinking about you know how do you how do you decide what it is that is going to be the the national agenda for, for physics this year or how do you decide what your institute is going to focus on or what are the big questions and why and how are you going to build a team and um how are we going to share that knowledge i mean we it's just one thing the pandemic has really taught us it's that scientists are really mostly pretty bad communicators and we don't understand things like public health we don't understand human behavior we don't understand what incentivizes people to to do things and we so we need more of that kind of multidisciplinary approach to some of the questions we're asking even though they're fundamental science questions we need to to be more creative in thinking about how we're going to address them indeed further questions further comments
Come on, people, not so modest. <laughs> what do you see as the um, the biggest sort of roadblocks in in shifting cultures? Is it is it attitudinal? Is it you know is it institutional? Like changing changing hiring policies, for instance, at an institution is you know it's like it's like trying to it's trying to like turn a tanker. It's really difficult to change policies. Yeah, at that level, I think that that is the institutional uh, mill is 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 really tough to change. But what I also see is that if you look at, at young children, uh, ages six, seven, eight, around that age, they are sort of natural scientists in the way that mm. they think at, and look at things and experience the world around them. Mm. Um, and I've given talks for public schools where you notice that at the very young age, these things come naturally, but around the mm -hmm. age of 10, 12, that changes. Mm -hmm. In particular with girls, it's, it's very, very, very strict that that age range 10, 12, where they're excited about science and asking really good questions. When they're 12, they're just sitting there, arms crossed, okay, can this be over? Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah. And, and I've been thinking about what causes this. And, and one of my ideas is, and I haven't tested this anywhere, but one of my ideas is that because of the education system, training kids to, think in black and white so it's either right what you're doing or it's wrong and then you don't get good grades so you're constantly rewarded for doing exactly that mm -hmm. and only that so you're t teaching them tricks basically like you would train a dog or another animal mm -hmm. if the whole education system could stick to that sort of natural way of learning by experiments i think mm -hmm. you would already train kids from a very young age to take science as a natural thing that it mm -hmm. happens around them. And that, that does also include children from a lower social economic background uh, here in the Netherlands, uh, Turkish and Moroccan or other uh, minority groups mm -hmm. would come in much more naturally. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's, but it, it's, it's a difficult system. It's, it's really complicated, um, mm -hmm. but it's one of the things I've been thinking about, especially when the minority groups are concerned, why do we still not have 10% uh, Turkish professors in astronomy uh, or Moroccan or whatever. It's it's been there's plenty of time. Yeah, and there is a long history. There's long history and tradition from that part of the world in in those disciplines. So it's you know I mean uh, if there's one thing that we could do if we could stop gender stereotyping kids. I mean I, I also talk about this, but if we could stop and there's a ton of research. If we could stop gender stereotyping kids from birth from before birth, uh, and that means boys and girls because we disenfranchise boys as well. Um, that would be huge. Mm -hmm. That would just be huge to stop with the gender stereotyping. Yeah. And you have to catch that early. Uh, because the, the, the kids teach those stereotypes to each other, I yeah. find out. Yeah. The, the, yeah the, it's age five, it's already done. Yeah, the time when, when my girl started to ask for pink dresses, which we absolutely refused to buy for them, mm -hmm. was when they went to playgroup. And they discovered that other girls were wearing pink dresses. And why didn't they have them? Yeah, there's an interesting story. I have a boy-girl twin when they were four. My daughter insisted on having a pink princess dress. But they would swap around. So she would be the princess for half an hour. And then her brother would be the princess for half an hour. And that immediately disappeared as soon as they started school. Yep. Yeah, so, it's yeah. it's really insidious. It's it's. It's pervasive. It's I mean, I, if if we could if we could hold media and marketing accountable, if we could um, get clothing stores to if it was illegal, you know, if they're not going to do it voluntarily, then we have to legislate it. Um, but it really limits. It puts such limits and boundaries around tr young people and children. And I find that adults routinely pass the buck. They routinely say, it's the schools that should do it. And the schools, will, the teachers will say, it's the parents. And actually, it's all of us. It's really all of us. Um, even if you don't have children, it's all of us who need to challenge gender stereotyping of our children. It, it's so limiting to their potential. Samaya. So Thank you. Yeah, I think Tana had her, her literal hand up. Oh, Tana sorry, I didn't point, see but that. Then I can uh, make a couple of comments. Sorry, I think Tana was responding to something. Tana, go ahead. Uh, sorry to jump ahead. I did have my hand up at one point. Um, first of all, Imogen, this has been an incredible talk. Um, and it's great to hear from someone so senior um, 
not just about the issues that we're facing, but um, echoing something I say in all of my talks, this thing about how bad we are as scientists at doing evidence-based <laughs> interventions. We do a lot of stuff that makes us feel good. Yep. And, um, and so you were saying like, you know, what are some of the things, some of the challenges we face um, so we've pointed out on a societal level, there's this issue of gender stereotyping, um, but it's also our approach to how we do, for instance, outreach or public engagement, or if your idea is to get more of a certain um, previously excluded or underrepresented people into science is that we, in a Western sense, um, a lot of the work that I've seen over my time in the UK and, and in Europe and the US is very individualized. Mm -hmm. And there's evidence to suggest that um, if you want to encourage underrepresented people to engage with STEM, you need to involve their family and their community as well. Mm -hmm. So how we're doing, who we're talking to is not sufficient at this stage. You need to convince parents that they, their child can be a scientist. You need to convince the teachers and the principals of, you know, of these schools, of schools in certain areas that, um, that, the children at their school can be scientists or if you're depending on the school that you know certain people that they're not supporting they deserve you know to have the option mm -hmm. to become scientists as well all those kind of things so it's not earlier um just earlier before the talk we had a um a diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. workshop and they mentioned the concept of ubuntu which is a yeah. south african yeah. mm -hmm. concept of like you know about togetherness so the opposite of western individualism yes. And, um, and indeed the research shows that for people who come from those kind of backgrounds, African backgrounds or Middle Eastern backgrounds where, you know, for instance, family is so important and what mm -hmm. you would call extended family is so important, all that kind of stuff. That's very community-based. Yep. Um, reaching out to parents, teachers, community leaders, all those kind of things are extremely important. And even religious leaders yep. um, is extremely important if you want to win the, as you would say in the US, win the hearts and minds, mm -hmm. you know, of the public. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing I think that's that's missing in whether it's science communication, EDI, um, decolonization, whatever the issues are, it's not you can't, you can talk to a 12 year old as um, I think it was Ilse, you can talk to them all you want as a 12 year old, they're not going to listen to you, uh, but they might listen to their parents, they might listen to their favorite librarian, they might listen to their, um, to a religious leader at the, you know, place of worship. So we need to, and yeah, we basically need to have a more holistic approach to um, who we're talking to and how we're addressing um, these shortfalls. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, and I, you know, the, the concept of Ubuntu is um, is one that intuitively to me makes t total sense. So in, um, and I would say that it's actually also um, aligns very well with indigenous ways of knowing. So if we look at how the people that have lived on this land where I'm, I am um, have 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 act, have try to understand the world around them. So, you know, observe what's going on, observe the seasons, observe the animals, observe the heavens, whatever, you know, and, and then come up with stories to figure out what's going on, which is the, the original form of knowledge translation. Um, they see themselves as part of the whole system. So it's, so it's separate from the sort of Western scientific approach of the scientist being, being separate and observing in this objective way. The indigenous approach is that I am part, I am related to the land. I am part of the land. I, I am with the land. I am of the land. Um, and therefore my understanding of the land and the observations I make and, and my explanations um, has to factor me into it. So I have to factor myself into my understanding, which raises the sort of concept of being so much more self-aware that allows you to position yourself relative to what you're doing as opposed to separate. And being self-aware is, is absolutely central to understanding how to um, create cultures of care that are rigorous and inclusive and, and remove bias and are transparent and are fair and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, the, the concept of Ubuntu, the, uh, and I am because you are of the community, and the concept of understanding different, you know, different ways of knowing, it's like different, different ways, of, different from what? Like we've got this one normative way of doing it? No, actually, maybe the Western ways, like that's a different, like this is actually the people that have been around for millennia before the rise of the sort of 
you know, met Eurocentric medieval way of thinking about science had a had a way of knowing. And so maybe the Eurocentric way is a different way of knowing. We can argue about that. Um, but so I think um, we, the myth of objectivity and the myth of meritocracy have really got in the way of our ability to leverage and bring in people who want to contribute and who are interested. And Toronto is the most diverse city in North America, which I think people don't realize. It has, you know, my classes have 160 languages. 70% of my classes are racialized. Um, and so in order to create science that's, that's accessible and even public messaging for the pandemic that's accessible, we have to go through you know, 60 different languages, actually send South Asian people out into South Asian communities, the Somali community, that kind of thing. And so um, that, that's huge value, huge amounts of work and huge value and not enough recognition. So talking about metrics, you know, another paper that's going to sit in a journal that nobody reads compared to somebody who does public messaging around, um, you know, vaccinations in a in a low income immigrant community and raises that vaccination rate to 80% or whatever, um, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty valuable, I would say. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a much broader way of thinking about how we do things. Are you right? Um, yeah, I had something that uh, related uh, back to um, Ilza. Ilse's comments on, on school and children uh, of particular age when they something changes. Um, I, at some point, I, I suspect that uh, the, the development of the human brain goes in steps, especially in the young age until uh, adolescence. And <clears throat> at some point, I think there's a phase where people become, where, where the children become really self-aware that they suddenly start to see themselves hang on a minute uh i do this or i like this and the people around me are, are different and that is not for every child at the same age but it's a it's a separate step the, uh, that the brain needs to make in, in its development and i think that that is sort of around the point where they start to um uh transition from the uh uh, I don't care what everybody else is thinking and doing. I like uh, doing this and that. I, I'm a mini scientist. And then suddenly this, this development phase in the brain happens. And then they start to critically look around and compare themselves and realizing that, hey, I am different than, than others. And, and maybe depending on the, on the reactions, the feedback that you get uh, at that time, uh, you either get uh, confirmation and continue, or actually you um, hold back yourself. But I, I wonder if yeah. that's uh, if so. That there's is no, there's no doubt that culture and context are huge, and and culture and context have. Uh, there is a stage at which culture and peer groups have much more influence, and it is around that age group. So the nature of the culture and the peer group is incredibly influential. The thing that I always think is really interesting is if you look at sort of, let's say, 15 year olds around the world, and there's a big study that is done, it's called the PISA study, it's done by the OECD, it's every couple of years, they do math and science, and then they'll do reading and something else. And they, they evaluate 15 year olds around the world on a regular basis for a whole variety of characteristics and what they think and aspirations of science and whatever. Um, and you can see, depending on the context, and the culture, there are variable responses. So if you are, you know, a 15 year old girl in Korea, or if you're a 15 year old girl in Brazil, or a 15 year old boy in South Africa or whatever, then your, your culture and context um, have more influence, despite the fact that we know that 15 year olds are developing, you know, the bi human biology is not varying around the world. And so, I'm always, I mean, I had somebody try to explain to me, a father tried to explain to me one time that there was a gene for a gene that girls had for loving pink. If you look at, you know, if you look at history, pink is actually a little boy's color because it was the lighter color of red and red was the British army color. And then, you know, pink became popular because there was a, a, an American president's wife that wore it to inaugural, and then pink took off. Blue, light blue because little flowers are light blue was little girls color so there's all you know i mean we can go back and we can look at the history and how what an artificial construct it is and what a cultural construct it is 
um, and how influential culture and peer groups become at that age. So it really is about creating cultures that support and, and normalize. If you look at a lot of our engineers, you know, that they can be women who come from the, from the Middle East. Like they grew up in cultures where everybody takes physics, Eastern Europe, like, you know, Eastern Europe, Russia, girls take physics. It's like, it's like reading and writing and physics. Um, in, the, in the Middle East, it can be um, girls take physics, but it can be a socioeconomic divide there. So rich kids who get the opportunity to go to good schools, whereas poor girls and boys aren't taking physics in, in parts of the world. So cultural context are huge and the, the timing with, with development is important for sure. Yeah, it, on the one hand, I find knowledge and understanding about the, those things extremely healthy and helpful. It also sometimes make me, makes me feel miserable because it sometimes makes me feel that we are so far down the chain mm -hmm. that it also sometimes makes me feel that the best we can do is clean up a little bit of the mess that has already been created. We're just not there at the point when, when the bad things really happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I see the conversation. About, so the, the, it's like, let's just let kids have all the colors, all the sports. Like kids can have all the colors, all the sports. Um, like boys can have pink. Uh, you know, boys can figure skate, girl. boys can be nurses. Girls can uh, play football. I don't know. When I was growing up, I went to a privileged girls' school in Cambridge. Um, we didn't play football, soccer. Um, in fact, it was a joke. But now, I mean, so to, to your to your comments, Ralph, it, it is depressing. I get it. I my rage drives me. So I'm you know I keep getting angry about it, and that drives me forward. But at the same time, there have been shifts. So you know, girls do play football now, and you know that kind of thing. So I I try to balance that off. Um, but this there's resistance because there's money and people with power and privilege don't want to give it up and there's money involved. So that's the, that's the challenge. Yeah. But at least we can play um, as much as a part of we can as part of society, but we yeah, can't do it. We should. Yeah. Science in it for those bigger problems, science, we can't view ourselves in isolation. We, we can fix ourselves, our own communities, but yeah. But there's also a pull, I feel. I mean, the encouraging thing is that, I mean, role models do work. So uh, well, let me tell you, the, the, the data and evidence in support of role models is not as strong as people think. Definitely it's better than nothing, but role models are not as strong. Um, representation matters. So role models can help. But the, the, data, the data and evidence are not as strong, you know. So I just, I always caution people on the role model. You know, oh yeah, so represent by a representation, you mean having people from minorities actually present in your place, right? Yeah, so representation in terms of normalizing the presence of people from diverse backgrounds in yes. certain situations. So yeah. nobody wants to be Marie Curie. Like Marie, I don't, nobody wants to be Marie Curie. She died a horrible, you know, painful death, right? But just seeing your local high school physics teacher being a woman you know, that can be influential. So, I mean, then maybe that's a role model. Maybe that I was just going to say, I mean, could you, the, 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 I guess now I'm slightly confused because I would call that a role model. <laughs> uh, it could be a role model for certain, for certain individuals. So, but I think we tend to, we tend to hold up. The, so there's some data that says when you present, so, so this is particularly girls in science, when you present role models as being, these people who have made it, which is quite a long way from where somebody is, on the basis that that will inspire people, it can actually backfire. It can actually backfire. Um, and some young women will say, oh, it's too, you know, it's too, I can't be like that. It's too much. Um, it, or it but, could it be that, that, they, that they think, oh my God, I don't feel or uh, act like that at all. So I can't be that. Is that it? It, it it could be that as well. But if you have something, so the near peer effect is very strong. So if you have something that's much closer to where somebody is, so an undergraduate can have a, could have a role model who is a graduate student, a graduate student could have a, you know, we might call them mentors, you know, a role model who is a, 
uh, a postdoc. A postdoc might have a role model who is an early professor, that kind of thing. Um, that is actually more impactful because the person that you're trying to help can see themselves, can relate to that, can see themselves reflected. But a role model is, it can be very far removed. And so it can be, um, it, it's part, it, it can be one of the tools that you can use. But we've, my observation is that we have relied on role models very heavily because it's easier to say, here are some role models, let's make some posters, whatever, and then be done. It kind of ticks the corporate social responsibility box, as opposed to saying, how can we support and reward people for doing the work that is that kind of representation? Um, or what, you know, they shouldn't have to, but they may be doing that work in, in whatever environment they're in. So I encourage the near peer approach. I encourage mentorship and particularly sponsorship is big. I think role models are fine, but it's not nearly enough. I tell, I suggest organizations remove their, you know, their dude walls, which is the, all the old white guys who are on walls in photographs and that kind of stuff and make that much more diverse. Think about the messaging that that is sending. You know, you know, you could stick up pictures of, of, you know, women in astronomy, but what about, you know, what about the first black man to do something? What about the, the per first disabled person to do something? So think about it a bit more so holistically. So um, I'm not, a, I'm actually not a big fan of role models, but role models are useful. They're one of the. Yeah, yeah no, but I, 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 I now understand better what you mean. You're, 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 you're worried that they are used too much as kind of the easy show model, and now we're done. Or also that that people feel they are an unreachable ideal, yeah. and, uh, something that's too far away from where they yeah. are, and therefore not a realistic target to shoot at. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I can understand that. Thanks very much for that clarification. Other questions and comments yeah I, there, there is a discussion going on in the in in the chat that you may have seen which is the, mm -hmm. the most egregious immediate utterance of gender differences in the netherlands is that you serve different color desserts when 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 boys are born or when girls are born <laughs> and of course they are pink and blue and, uh, There's an interesting history to that, which, it, you know, that really dates back to um, when um, when it became possible for to use ultrasound to reveal uh, the, the sex, not the gender, the sex of the baby before birth. So the, the rise of the pink and blue is really a marketing ploy, which came out of the sort of advance of medical technology that, that allowed you to say, oh, it looks like you're going to have a boy in three months. Um, which then added to the marketing opportunities for companies to promote stuff. So how can we, if you're going to have a boy, how can we promote selling stuff to you? And that's if you actually track um, the sort of rise of the, of the pinkification and the, the gender reveal kind of nonsense. It dates back to the development of the technologies that allow people to determine the sex of the baby. So it's, it's really tied up in money and marketing and media and pitching. How can we sell more stuff? more stuff you don't need to, to more people. And so we have to really be, um, you know, intentional about challenging and pushing back on that. Some people are like, let's let toys be toys is a great website in the UK for, for, um, you know, pushing for better quality kind of stuff for kids. You've just absolutely flabbergasted me. <laughs> I, 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 I really, I, I would not have guessed that the pink blue distinction is so recent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a, uh, this is why I love, you know, I'm a polymath. I know a little bit about lots of things. And one of the great things about Ryerson is it has one of the few schools of fashion um, in a, at a big university in Canada. And the school of fashion was right next to, to the school of, to the faculty of science. So I had friends in the school of fashion and they're doing a lot of really social justice stuff around fashion, which is so cool and really interesting. But we would have these great conversations. This is why, this is why we need to talk to other disciplines, you know, about the history of um, clothing and the history of colors and the way um, social status is defined by what you're wearing and how, you know, all of these kinds of things. And, and, and then it ties into medical technology, right? The same with computer games. The PCs were marketed to boys. So why do we have this bro culture? In, in tech, well, computer computing was an administrative secretarial kind of discipline. 
from the 50s. And if you looked at who was enrolled, it went up, the number of girls enrolled in computing went up, like law, like medicine, and then it crashed in the 80s. Girls stopped coding. Why did it crash in the 80s? Well, one interpretation of those data um, is that the 80s were the rise of the PC. How are we going to market PCs? How are we going to get PCs into every home? We'll make them toys for boys and we'll make them places where you can, you can go do gaming. And so that became the culture of the, you know, the tech bro culture. It was exclusionary. It wasn't for girls anymore. And, and if you look at marketing and you look at ads and all that kind of Radio Shack ads and that kind of thing, you'll see that it's always like little boys playing and their sister is standing behind them, you know, watching. Um, and so it's very cultural. It's very cultural and it's very, um, you know, it's, I mean, it's a stupid business model because why wouldn't you want to market to girls and boys? You double your market, right? But it was, a, it was somebody made us, people made a strategic decision to say, that's how we're going to pitch it. We're going to market it that way. Well, and, and that was totally. uh, were they perhaps gambling on the fact that families would be more likely to spend money on something the boys yeah. wanted than on something the girls wanted? Absolutely. And there's good data that supports that as well. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, mm. I have a whole, I've given talks on this for a long time. So, yeah, I mean, the, 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 again, if we go back to the data and the evidence and the research, um, there's some good stuff out there. There's a, there's a great um the gina davis institute for uh, uh women in the media is a has, has tons of great data oh wow because great. she she put money including stem um yeah <laughs> you know gender yeah. and if it's the pink toothbrush you pay pay more for it at the store you know <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. The, the pink tax yeah um Yes, yeah, the same thing that shaving cream for women is more expensive than shaving cream yeah. for men, for God's sake. Stupid. I, Stupid. Yes. Try buying clothes. Yeah. 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 All so. right. So um, I think we are sort of nearing the moment where we have to wrap up, but not quite yet. I promised Imogen we would keep her occupied until no later than about five. First of all, let me thank you for volunteering to make your slides available. That would be really great. If you mail them to me, I'll make sure they get distributed because indeed there were lots of resources there that I wasn't able to write down fast enough. Yeah, absolutely. So, Happy to do that. Okay, so final comments and questions, please. I really did mean that there was opportunity for more. I didn't mean to cut it off now. <laughs> yeah, I think some people have meetings starting at the hour, so they wouldn't mind having a short break between. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to, to, to say from my point, thank you very much. That was a, 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 a wonderful talk and very interesting. And it was so full of information. So I look forward to reading your slides. <laughs> Yeah, I did realize that I packed a lot in, but it, it's really about the, the resources that, and, and then you can go like figure out what's useful to you and, and what's relevant to you. So um, there you go. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, I, 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 I really appreciate that. I mean, that there's homework to do and, 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 and mm -hmm. giving us starting points for that homework is extremely useful. So in that case, I, let, me, uh, let me close the proceedings then by once again saying, thank you very, very much, Imogen. Um, we will learn a lot from you. Um, and, and maybe at some point we'll kind of um, loop back and, uh, and, and, and let you know how things are going and, and mm -hmm. maybe consult you on some matters that keep vexing us. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. I would love to hear how things are going and, and learn from your experiences as well. So it all informs it all informs my work. So thank you so much. Okay. I hope our paths will cross in real life one day. And uh, yes, everybody take care and stay safe. Yeah, take care. Okay, bye, Imogen. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.